Welcome everybody and thank you for coming to this program. I'm representing Roe Conference, the Roe Center, which is presenting this and also is having Sandor come and do a live program in, what is it, November, right? And it, um, it's our great pleasure to have Sandor come here. Roe is a lovely little conference center in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. And it'd be great if all of you could come sometime. I know some of you have, because I see familiar names, even a board member. So <laughs> anyway, it's, it's great to have Sandor here. I'll tell you a little bit about him. His books, Wild Fermentation and the Art of Fermentation, both won the James, which won the James Beard Award, have helped catalyze a broad revival of the fermentation arts. A self-taught experimentalist, I assume you haven't really blown anything up yet, <laughs> who lives in rural Tennessee. Sander was honored in 2014 with the Craig Claiborne Lifetime Achievement Award from Southern Foodways Alliance. His most recent book is Sander Katz's Fermentation Journeys, Recipes, techniques, and traditions from around, from around the world. So, I will turn it over to you, Sandor. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that uh, that that introduction, and um, uh, uh, thank you to um, uh, the the people from as far as Australia who are who are joining us, um, and. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, my personal fermentation journey, how I got interested in fermentation and how I got into this. I'm going to talk a little bit about my um, um, book, Fermentation Journeys, and some of the um, uh, foods and beverages that are in it. I'm going to talk a little bit about my upcoming class at the Rowe Center. Uh, uh, which is called Fermentation Journeys. And um, in the course of that, I'll do a little bit of show and telling. And um, and then, although, I mean, I definitely could go on and on and talk for our full hour or many hours about fermentation. Um, it'll be more interesting for me and for you if uh, it's a little bit more interactive. So, you know, if you came here with any questions, if any questions come up for you in the course of my talk, um, uh, write them in into the chat and um, uh, you know I, I, it's, uh, if there's a lot of questions we might not get to everybody's but um, 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 you know if, if something piques your interest uh, or if you came with a question please ask it and we will uh, get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. So um, well my fermentation journey uh, um, you, you know I I grew up eating certain products of fermentation like almost every person in almost every part of the world. Um, uh, you know, the particular fermented food that, um, you know, that, that I was really drawn to as a kid was pickles. And uh, I grew up in New York City. Um, uh, all of my grandparents were immigrants from Eastern Europe. The kinds of pickles that we were eating uh, were the Eastern European style pickles that are uh, widely available in, in New York. Um, I, you know, I had no idea how they were made. I just knew that I loved them. And I had a reputation in my family for being the one who would eat all the pickles in the pickle jar. And um, but but I, but I noticed even as a kid that not all pickles tasted the same and that like, you know, I didn't like all pickles as much as I loved the pickles uh, uh, that we were eating. And what I later came to understand is that the pickles that we were eating were, were made by fermenting cucumbers in a brine. Uh, 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 in this style of pickles, typically no vinegar is added, and the acidification uh, comes from fermentation based on lactic acid bacteria that are always on the cucumbers, um, um, and they acidify it, and, and meanwhile, it's in a saltwater brine solution, generally with lots of garlic and, and dill and sometimes uh, uh, other, other seasonings. So anyway, I was drawn to this flavor. We also, you know, had a lot of yogurt in our refrigerator and ate a lot of yogurt, so I was drawn to flavors of fermentation, but I wasn't really thinking about fermentation. And I wasn't watching anybody, um, a grandparent or anything who was fermenting anything. 
Um, you know, then fast forward, I'm in my mid twenties. I spent a couple of years following a macrobiotic diet and macrobiotics places an emphasis on the digestive benefit of pickles and other kinds of live ferments. And, you know, I started noticing that these pickles that I had been eating and loving my entire life, whenever I would eat them, I could feel the salivary glands under my tongue squirting out saliva. And I really began to associate these foods with getting my digestive juices flowing and also started, um, um, you know, getting a little bit of a sense of, you know, probiotics and, you know, the, the ways in which bacteria can potentially improve digestion and improve immune function. Um, but I was still living in New York City. I was eating fermented foods more regularly, but I, I still wasn't making them myself. And, you know, the change in my life that was the catalyst for investigating how to ferment things myself is that I moved from New York City to rural Tennessee about 30 years ago, and, uh, and I still live here. Um, and I started gardening. And that first year that I was gardening, I mean, I was such a naive city kid that it had never even occurred to me that in a garden, uh, 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 all of the radishes would be ready at about the same time, all the cabbages would be ready at about the same time. So the first year that I was gardening and we had a nice row of cabbages, um, I decided I should learn how to make sauerkraut. I knew sauerkraut had something to do with preserving cabbage. I knew that I loved it. And, um, you know, I looked in the joy of cooking and I learned how to make sauerkraut from the joy of cooking. It was deceptively simple. You shred vegetables, salt them, season them if you like, pound them or squeeze them a little bit, pack them tightly into a vessel and, and wait. And that first batch was so delicious that it just inspired me to start playing around, you know, adding different kinds of vegetables, seasoning it in different ways, experimenting with lengths of, of fermentation and levels of salt and, and all the different variables. And, um, and then I started playing around with uh, yogurt making, making country wines. And before too long, I was just completely obsessed and, uh, you know, looking in, you know, cookbooks of, you know, every kind of cuisine, trying to find examples of fermentation and learn how to make them. And, um, and that led me into some teaching and that led me into first writing a small booklet that I self-published. And then, you know, that led me to writing wild fermentation and that led me to a book tour. And then my book tour really never, never ended. I mean, I started in the summer of 2003 when wild fermentation was published and, you know, I've, sort of my, my life has become the life of an itinerant fermentation educator. And I've, I've, I've taught about fermentation in almost all of the states of the US, in most of the provinces of Canada, and in about 30 other countries of, 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 of the world. And, um, um, you know, I have, a, I have an incredible life that I couldn't have uh, uh, imagined for myself. But all these places that I go, I also learn about new fermented foods and beverages that I didn't know about. And so, you know, for some years, I've had the idea that eventually I would write a book about for foods and beverages that I was learning about in my travels. Um, and the opportunity to, to do that came in 2020 when all my plans got canceled. And, you know, that year I was supposed to go to Peru. I was supposed to go to Taiwan. Um, I was supposed, supposed to go to Iceland. And, you know, when all my plans, like everybody else's, got canceled, um, you know, I, I spent the, the, the first pandemic year writing uh uh, uh, writing this book, uh, Fermentation Journeys. And, um, you know, it's stories from my travels, but really focused on, 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 on foods. And, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, in lots of different regions of the world. And it's not only foods that I've learned about in my own travels, it's foods I've learned about from, um, you know, immigrants and people from different places. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a compendium of new information of, about fermented foods around the world. Fermentation is practiced everywhere. Um, um, you know, my thinking about this is that, uh, you know, the simple reality that microbiology is illuminated for us that, um, you know, all all of our, um, uh, everything that we eat, all of the plants and all of the animal products that make up our food are populated by microorganisms. So there's a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food. And just as a, as a practical matter, people, every, people in every different region of the world, you know, developed techniques to work with the life forces on food that they didn't specifically know about. I mean, we've only really known about bacteria for and, and other microorganisms for the past 150 years or so. 
um, and understood that fermentation was driven by microbial action. But people have been fermenting for at least 10,000 years, according to the archaeological record, and presumably much longer than that, because the earlier vessels weren't pottery shards that have stuck around, but rather, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, hollowed out wood, gourds, uh, uh, animal membranes, you know, different things that um, you know, have, have biodegraded. So, you know, fermentation is practiced absolutely everywhere and, you know, in, in really disparate ways. I mean, you know, in a lot of places, um, you know, fermentation, uh, uh, you know, and food preservation and food practices in general just grow out of climate conditions. I mean, you know, starting with what kinds of food resources are available in different places. Um, um, but, you know, so, some fermentation uh, uh, processes are, you know, extremely specific to specific places. Like, you know, earlier in this year, or, uh, earlier this year, I had the chance to teach in the Faroe Islands. And the Faroe Islands are the, the this little group of islands in the North Atlantic, kind of between Iceland and Scotland. And um, in the Faroe Islands, they have a technique for, for fermenting the legs of sheep, uh, uh, which, you know, it was, is really sort of contrary to the, a, lot, a lot of the ideas that I had about fermenting meat and is sort of unique to the climate in that particular place. And basically they do nothing. You know, that right around this time of year, the end of September, the beginning of October, they slaughter uh, the sheep that they're going to slaughter, and then they take the legs and then they hang them in these special buildings that everybody with sheep has called a chotler. And it's basically wooden, wooden boards with tiny little uh, uh, gaps between them so the wind can blow through the gaps. And the islands are very windy, and because they're these small islands, the wind carries salt from the sea. And so, you know, they're not even salting the meat, like the, 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 the wind is carrying in the salt and salting the meat. And then, you know, the, 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 the cool but moderate conditions, um, um, you, you know, sort of allow the meat to hang for months and slowly dry out from the wind and, and, and slowly accumulate salt, um, you know, and they have this most extraordinary dry cured meat product uh, 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 that's, that, that's at, at, the, at the end of it. Um, so, you know, certain ferments are, are very particular to particular places, but, you know, other kinds of ferments, uh, um, you know, are much more um, uh, uh, broad and, and could be done anywhere. So, you know, for instance, something that I've really, you know, gotten very interested in, I mean, you know, my maternal grandparents who I knew were from Belarus and, you know, all across Eastern Europe, including in Belarus, there's a, 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 a tradition of soaking oats. Kessil is the name that they use in Belarus. And um, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, it couldn't be simpler. I mean, you just take oats, you know, it could be rolled oats, it could be steel cut oats, uh, and you soak them. And, uh, you know, you can soak them just overnight, or you can soak them for several days. Um, um, I like to soak them for several days. And then what I do is I strain out the, 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 the water from the oats, the soaking water, it's like oat milk. It's just like, you know, it's no work oat milk. Um, you, you know, the starch and flavor from the uh, uh, oats is infusing into this water. Um, um, uh, uh, it's fermenting a little bit, so it gets ever so mildly acidified. Uh, it's starchy, it's delicious. And then I take the, the oats themselves and put some fresh water over them and I cook them into, uh, in, in, into oatmeal. Um, um, and, uh, you know, it's just incredibly creamy, uh, uh, really delicious. Um, you know, one of the nutritional benefits of, of fermentation is um, uh, pre-digestion. So, you know, basically the nutrients of the grains get broken down, minerals that are otherwise unavailable to our digestive system become much more bioavailable to us. Um, and, it, and it's actually like learning about Kisil reminded me of some articles that I read when I was working on uh, uh, my, 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 my biggest book, uh, uh, The Art of Fermentation. Um, but there, you know, I mean, uh, cereal porridges like oatmeal are, 
you know, kind of historically have been the, the almost a universal weaning food for babies. Uh, um, you, you know, the, the first solid food that the babies have typically eaten after coming off of their, 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 their mother's milk. And there have been all these interesting studies showing much, you know, higher levels of infant survival for infants who are weaned off of their mothers with fermented cereal porridges as opposed to non-fermented cereal porridges. And there's basically two reasons. One is the greater nutrient bioavailability. So the kids are getting, you know, fuller, better uh, uh, nutrition from the porridges, but also because of the acidification, there's less possibility of, you know, salmonella or other kinds of food poisoning. Um, um, so there's just like less diarrhea and less illness among the among the infants. So anyway, um, you know, casil is an example of something that just like couldn't be easier. Like the only step of the fermentation is you soak the the the, the oats. Um, let me talk a little bit about the 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 the, the course that I'm going to be giving at. Um, at, at, at Roe. So it's uh, uh, the weekend of, uh, uh, I think, November 18th and, and uh, 18th to 20th. Um, it's uh, the, the Friday to Sunday before Thanksgiving. Um, and um, so, you know, we, we'll be making and trying kisil, we'll be making some injera, we'll be making miju, which is a Chinese style of, 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 of rice alcohol. Um, uh, we'll be making pao tsai, which I'm about to show you and, and talk about, which is a Chinese style of, of fermenting vegetables. We'll make some beetroot kvass, which is a Ukrainian ferment. It's a, it's, it's a beverage based on, on, on fermenting beets. Uh, we'll make tepache, which is a, a Mexican, a lightly fermented soft drink made from pineapple skins. Um, and we'll be uh, 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 making some nem, which is a, a Thai style of fermenting pork ribs in a paste of rice and garlic and salt, uh, uh, which is just so incredibly delicious. Um, let me talk a little bit about Pao Tsai and my trip to China. And um, 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 I, I tried to copy the link, but but it turns out I, I didn't copy it effectively. But I have um, um, on YouTube eight videos uh, uh, um, covering different foods, fermented foods that I learned about in my travels in China. And um, uh, the, the series is called People's Republic of Fermentation. And if you search, you know, either on Google or on YouTube for People's Republic of Fermentation, you'll find this sort of series of, you know, it's about eight, uh, it's eight roughly 10 minute episodes, each one covering a different fermented food or beverage. Uh, um, so, so definitely check them out. One of them is about Pao Tsai. Um, you know, the, the story of how, you know, I met the, the, this woman, Mrs. Ding, who gave me my first lesson in Pao Tsai making and whose you know, recipe I I've, I've, I've been following in, in the Pao Tsai that I've been making um, is, uh, is, is kind of amusing. And uh, um, I arrived in China in Chengdu, the capital of um, um, uh, uh, Sichuan province. And it, you know, it's a big city. It's like, you know, the size of New York City. And, um, you know, I was pretty jet lagged. I, I, I was meeting my travel companions there. And, um, you know, the first day we didn't have any plans and we just went out for a walk and we were just walking around the neighborhood where, where our hotel was. And, um, uh, you know, I was traveling with three other people, um, all of whom spoke Chinese. I was the only non-Chinese speaker in our, in our party. And, um, on the street, outside of somebody's window, I saw some uh, uh, sausages hanging and curing. And I like whipped out my phone and I started taking pictures of them. But the woman whose sausages they were saw me taking photos and then came outside. And then, you know, th then we had a long conversation with her, told her about what we were doing. When she heard that we were interested in pickles, she invited us in and she served us a, a most incredible lunch. 
And then she sent us to the market with her husband to buy vegetables. And then she gave us a pickling lesson and she showed us her pickling crock and, and sort of, uh, you know, explained to us her, her method. And, you know, what's really distinctive about this um, uh, uh, Poutsai method is, you know, you make a brine and, and, and then it's a perpetual brine. So, you know, the brine is, has a, uh, relatively low salt content and, and, and you start it with a little bit of sugar um, and then you put some seasonings in, uh, uh, chili peppers, Sichuan peppercorns. Um, let's see, what else do I have in here? I have the, uh, um, uh, 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 black cardamom. Um, uh, uh, I have um, uh, star anise and um, and then I also have a little bit of dried grated licorice root. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the first batch of, of um, vegetables that you put in there, you put in for about two weeks. Um, and, you know, the bacteria on the vegetables and on the spices, uh, um, you know, starts driving the fermentation in there. But then when you take those vegetables out, you put more vegetables in. And then you just keep taking vegetables out, putting them in. And I mean, at certain points when I've when I've been traveling, doing uh, uh, presentations and demonstrating this, you know, I've just put vegetables in for a day, taken them out, uh, 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 served them, put more vegetables in, left them in for a day. Typically, I leave them for a longer period of time. Um, you know, actually, I'm, I've just gotten home about a week ago from uh, traveling for three weeks. And I just took this uh, uh, out of the refrigerator where it was resting. And I'm finding some slices of vegetables that have been in there for a couple of months. Mm. And I mean, they're like sour. They're still kind of crispy. Um, you know, the, the, the spicing has absorbed all the way into the center of them. But you just pull those veggies out and then you put more veggies in. And so I just dug up some of the early um, uh, uh, rat, daikon radishes in my garden. These are beautiful purple daikons. And I'm just going to I'm just going to put these into the into the pout side. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, sometime in the in the in the coming day, days or week, I'll um I'll enjoy those vegetables uh, 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 pickled in the pout side. With a perpetual brine like this, I mean, you do, you know, because salt and the seasonings do migrate out with the vegetables. Oh, there's also ginger in there. Um, uh, uh, because salt and seasonings migrate out with the vegetables. I mean, periodically, I add a little bit of salt to it. Periodically, I, ref I refresh the, 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 the spices not necessarily all at the same time. It's really a lot about the, the, the flavors that I perceive and, you know, what is, what flavors running thin and, you know, really needs to need, needs a stronger push. You know, there's nothing sacrosanct about the group of, of seasonings that I put in. I mean, over the course of the next two weeks in China, we tried lots of different people's pout size and everybody's is different. You know, these, these things are not standardized. Um, 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 you know, fermentation is, 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 you know, sort of very much, um, uh, uh, you know, open to interpretation. Um, and, you know, the, the, you know, the, the methodology might be consistent in a region, but then, you know, how much salt people use, uh, uh, uh what kinds of vegetables they use, um, what kinds of seasonings they use will, um, you know, will, will vary quite a bit. Um, you know, another, another uh, food that I have a section about in this, in this book is um, natto. So natto is a Japanese soybean ferment. And, um, you know, it's, it's maybe a little bit notorious among people who know about it, who are not Japanese, because it has a very uh, a, a strong flavor with a sort of hint of ammonia. It's an example of an alkaline ferment that makes byproducts that are, that are related to ammonia. And it also makes a, a kind of mucilaginous coating on, on the beans 
that um, you know a lot of people find challenging. I mean, the first time I tried natto, I did not like it, but I have come to really love natto. Um, and you know, I was encouraged by some people I really respected to you know to give it another try. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I could see how that's a little bit like camembert cheese. But you know, now I love it and I crave it. But in my travels, I mean, in China, in Burma, um, uh, in 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 other places, I I learned that. In other cultural contexts, the same kind of ferment is used, but instead of being used fresh and wet and slimy, people dry it. And um, so actually, I was just gifted this in, in Switzerland um, uh, uh, two weeks ago. I met a German Thai woman um, um, who has you know, been really like connecting with her Thai culture through fermentation. And this is a disc. Uh, Toi no, um, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, um, um, but this is a form similar to what I saw in Burma, which I wrote about in uh, Fermentation Journeys, but this is basically a little dried um, um, pancake of natto, and so, you know, she uses this as a seasoning. Uh, uh, in different things. I mean, she actually gave us this beautiful, like dipping sauce spread that was made with this as an ingredient that was just so, so wonderful. What I've been doing with it is um, I've been dehydrating natto. So this is a jar of just dehydrated natto. Once you dehydrate it, it becomes shelf stable. I dehydrate it at low temperatures, which um, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I believe maintains some level of the probiotics of the, the bacteria that drives the fermentation, which is Bacillus subtilis. And then I grind up those whole dried natto uh, uh, beans with um, roasted sesame seeds and salt. And I make a, a, you know, a little um, a, a powder uh, in my household. We call this special sauce and we put it on everything. And I've been you know, sharing it with a lot of my friends, even some of my friends who are very picky eaters. And you know, I have yet to find anybody who doesn't like this. It just, it's so delicious. It, it's compellingly delicious. And in a lot of different cultural contexts, natto-like foods are used as a seasoning, but not eaten sort of in its whole form, but mixed in in a small proportion with other ingredients, including in West Africa. And there's a whole group of, of uh, uh, seasonings across West Africa. Um, some names for it are Dawa Dawa, Iru, Sumbala, um, there's a lot of different names for it, and they're not made from soybeans, they're made from African locust beans and some other um, uh, legumes indigenous to Africa, but the process is the same and the sort of, um, um, uh, you know, smell and, and taste is very similar to, you know, these various uh, uh, Asian forms of, 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 of dried natto. Um, so anyway, I can go on and on, but it'll be so much more interesting for uh, for me and maybe for you if um, uh, uh, we uh, uh, open this up to some questions. So uh, um, let's see, uh, Fia, are there any questions yes, yet? Yes, there okay. are. Um, one uh, first question was, does it work with all kinds of brine? I think that was about the brine. That was about the pout side. Oh, yeah. maybe that would, that's like about like reusing brines in general. Um, I mean, sure. I, I mean, I would say up until I was in China and sort of saw this kind of pickle based on a perpetual brine, I typically was counseling people to make a fresh brine with every, with every, with every batch. Um, but, you know, I mean, since, since then I've, I've been, um, you know, experimenting more with, um, um, reusing brines and, you know, the tricky thing about reusing brines, like, okay, so cucumbers, yeah, you know, I mean, cucumbers are sort of the classic, um, um, sort of European example of something that you would ferment under a brine. And what's tricky about cucumbers is that, you know, they can get soft and mushy. Um, um, I'll bet that people who are on here, I bet there are some people on here who've tried like fermenting cucumbers and ended up with something really soft and mushy. And that's because of enzymes. And we know, what makes vegetables crispy and crunchy are pectins, um, 
uh, salt hardens pectins in the short run, and then in the long run, salt um, uh, 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 inhibits enzymes that break down pectins, pectinase enzymes. So, you know, the, 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 the danger, let's say you make a batch of, of, of um, cucumbers to ferment and, you know, you ferment the first batch for, uh, you know, 10 days or two weeks, and then you eat them and then you put more cucumbers in them. Um, I mean, the, you know, the danger is like a lower salt content can definitely encourage them to get soft and mushy. If the first batch was already beginning to get soft and mushy, then it already has these pectinase enzymes floating around in it. And so, you know, I, I guess I would be careful about doing it with cucumbers. I would only do it if you really loved the first batch of cucumbers, they maintained an excellent crispness, um, you know, and you, you know, add enough salt to sort of get it back up to, um, um, you know, an adequate saltiness level. So those are the challenges of, um, um, you know, reusing a brine. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, with, with, with the Poutsai, I mean, I mostly have avoided putting, um, you know, softer hot weather vegetables in and mostly try to put firm vegetables in. Um, um, to avoid getting a, a, an accumulation of those kinds of pectinase enzymes. Second question. Can one use a different type of sweetener in the Poutsai? Yeah, sure. I mean, and in fact, you could use no sweetener at all. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make it sweet. Like adding some sugar or some other kind of concentrated carbohydrate just makes that first batch of uh, 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 um, pickled vegetables get more sour faster. It's just adding a more concentrated carbohydrate that, that ferments. Um, so sure, I mean, you can use, you could use any form. And, and, and in fact, like most of the people I met in China who were using um, sugar in their pao tsai, we're using a very particular form of sugar that I've only seen in China. It's called ding ding tang. And um, uh, 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 tang is the word for sugar, and ding ding refers to the mobile vendors. So it's 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 this looks like Turkish taffy. Um, um, it's a malt-based sugar um, um, that that that's sort of cooked down, you know, until it's sort of like stretchy, um, um, and it looks just like Turkish taffy. It, 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 it's white, and the mobile vendors carry a, um, a chisel and a hammer, and ding ding refers to they let people know they're walking through the neighborhood by by dinging the chisel with the hammer. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's one of these strange things. I mean, I never saw Ding Ding Tang in a store or, or even in a market stall. The tradition is these mobile vendors that sort of walk around uh, uh, making a dinging noise with their the chisel that they use to break off a piece of it. So, you know, that's what Mrs. Ding swears by. Um, you know, I brought a little bit of it home and started my first pout sai with it, but it's not available in, in this country, although you can buy malt based sugars in this country and um, in a lot of Asian stores you could buy a jar of maltose or in stores like you know uh, um, natural food stores sometimes you can buy a bar of barley a jar of barley malt which is basically the same thing. Okay. What kind of foods do you flavor natto with? I'm wondering if that question means what do you use it on? I mean, anything savory. I mean, always on my eggs in the morning. This morning I had oatmeal. I put some in my oatmeal. I, I'm a savory oatmeal guy. So I, I put it with my, I, I wouldn't put it on, you know, um, um, an ice cream sundae, probably, unless I was having a savory ice cream sundae. But, um, uh, you know, any kind of savory food. I mean, I, I literally put it on almost everything because it's so delicious. You know, it's like, I, um, um, uh, uh, I mean, it makes almost anything taste better. I put certainly put it on sort of, you know, rice or stir fries. Um, you, you know, I had pesto the other night. I put it on my pesto. Um, you know, it's very, you know, versatile, um, you know, umami, uh, uh, richening flavoring. Um, any more info on how acidification aids to reduce bacteria? 
that's what it does? Well, sure. I mean, acidification doesn't necessarily reduce all bacteria, but, um, you know, it narrows the range of what can grow. And, you know, it's just very convenient for us. Like the reason why fermentation is so safe is that, um, uh, you know, the, the organisms that we associate with food poisoning and illness can't survive in an acidic environment. So, um, you know, this is just what makes fermented foods so safe. Um, and, you know, I know for, for people in our time who, you know, have grown up their entire lives hearing about how dangerous bacteria are um, uh, and how important it is to avoid them. You know, sometimes it's very easy to just project that anxiety onto the idea of fermentation. I mean, I just remember so clearly at the first fermentation workshop I ever taught in 1998, where I was showing people how to make sauerkraut, um, uh, you know, this woman held up her jar of sauerkraut of the, of, of the vegetables we just shredded and salted and packed into jars. And she just stared at it with this like extremely worried look on her face. And her question was, you know, how can I be sure I have good bacteria growing in there and not some bad bacteria that might, you know, make somebody sick or even kill somebody? And it's just so common for people to project all of the anxiety that they've been taught to have about bacteria onto the idea of fermentation. But the fact is, fermentation makes food safer. And the reason is that. You know, let's say we had some vegetables, uh, you know, let, let, let's say on my daikon radishes here, um, uh, you know, there were some cells of um, uh, salmonella or E. coli or, you know, something that could potentially make someone sick. And, you know, of course, we read every year about, you know, um, um, food poisoning outbreaks from raw vegetables. I mean, a few months ago, it was red onions. You know, one year it was uh, uh, lettuce. One year it was tomatoes. Uh, you know, clearly there's the possibility of, um, you know, vet vegetables being exposed to bacteria that can potentially make people sick. Usually the story is manure from a factory farm washes down over a field of vegetables and and that's the source of it you know we could imagine that it's also a failure of hygiene like somebody somebody handling the vegetables failing to wash their hands at some you know critical moment of hygienic intervention um but you know I, either way you know so if you eat that vegetable raw, there'd be some potential that those bacteria that, 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 that were on it could make you sick. But if you fermented them, the indigenous bacteria that are, that are you know, the, the lactic acid bacteria that are present, not only on all cabbage, not only on all radishes, not only on all vegetables, but on all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth. The lactic acid bacteria, once you get the vegetable submerged, will always dominate every single time. Uh, uh, and it's because you get the vegetables submerged and, you know, on everything we eat, there's a multitude of organisms on them and which organisms are going to grow is completely a question of, you know, environmental conditions and the practice of fermentation really is about manipulating environmental conditions in ways that encourage the growth of certain kinds of organisms while simultaneously discouraging the growth of other kinds of organisms. So anyway, you know, with fermented vegetables, you know, once once the lactic acid bacteria become dominant and start producing lactic acid, then if there happen to be some poor cells of salmonella or uh, E. coli or other organisms that could potentially make people sick, they perish. And, um, you know, the, 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 I mean, until about two years ago, I used to tell people, you know, what I had been told by a, by a, um, uh, uh, microbiologist for the U.S. Department of Agriculture that, that that they could not find any documented cases of food poisoning or illness anywhere in the world from fermented vegetables. Like now that's been slightly revised, which is a couple of years ago, there was an outbreak in Korea, you know, from kimchi that had barely been fermented. So the thing is, you need to ferment things for, you know, a, a handful of days in order to, for the acids to accumulate, which can, you know, kill the, 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 the other bacteria that, 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 that are present. But, you know, yes, acidification is a really, really wonderful, effective strategy for making food safer. Um, and it does it because, um, uh, you know, many bacteria just cannot tolerate acidification. And, um, 
you know, the, the magic number of in terms of pH is 4.6. And, you know, in, in, in the US, all the vegetable fermentation businesses have to, you know, test each batch and make sure <clears throat> that it has achieved a pH of at least 4.6 before before they sell it. But, you know, that that happens really within a handful of days. And so, I mean, I, I never test the pH. I mean, I have in the in the, you know, 30 years I've done it, I've done that a couple of times just to see but um, uh, you know it acidifies really, really quickly, and you can recognize that by by smell and by by flavor. So you answered somebody's question about being scared of getting not knowing if fermentation has the adequate microbes. I think you've covered that. Um, also, could there be a problem with using garlic in a perpetual brine due to botulism? No, no. I mean, I really like garlic has nothing to do with botulism. I mean, you know, this is a really common misconception because, you know, there have been a couple of cases of botulism of garlic under olive oil, but it has to do with olive oil, not with garlic. I mean, you know, garlic is no more likely to have um, a botulism than anything else. And, you know, by the way, Clostridium botulinum is such a common soil bacteria that probably most of the vegetables you've ever eaten in your life, garlic included, have cells of Clostridium botulinum. It's just that it can only create the toxin in a totally anaerobic environment and, you know, in the absence of oxygen and, you know, neither plants nor we spend much time in an environment like that. And the reason why, you know, we know the word botulism is because of this, you know, sort of clever process that was invented in France, uh, you know, 218 years ago, canning apertization, because they remember the name of Nicholas Apert, the clever man who, you know, figured out a way to um, uh, sterilize food in a jar. But, you know, the problem is that if you don't quite kill everything, Clostridium botulinum, when it's stressed by heat, creates these spores that can survive boiling temperatures. That's why when you can non-acid foods, you need to pressure cook them to get it even higher than that to kill the spores of Clostridium botulinum because in canning, you can create a perfect vacuum. That's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're creating a sterile environment and a vacuum um, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the can. And so you can potentially, if you, if you create a vacuum but don't, but, and kill everything except Clostridium botulinum, then you, know, you could, um, um, uh, you know, th then, then you have a problem. Um, um, you know, under olive oil, you know, it's possible to have, to create an anaerobic environment. And there've been a couple of cases of, uh, uh, botulism with garlic under, under olive oil. The simple way to do it is to, um, um, you know, toss the, the garlic in some, uh, vinegar before you put it in the olive oil and then and then you're acidifying it but but in a brine even though you're you're getting the vegetables submerged to protect them from the continuous flow of oxygen because you know let's say you had a bowl of loosely shredded vegetables you could leave it on your counter for you know, three days, three weeks, three months, it's never going to turn itself into sauerkraut. And it's very predictable what will happen, which is that little hairy molds will grow on all the cut surfaces of the vegetables. So, you know, in the presence of a continuous flow of oxygen, what will typically grow on vegetables are molds. And there are spores of molds on vegetables and on almost everything that we eat. Um, um, so, you know, our, our, our strategy for manipulating the environmental conditions so that lactic acid bacteria rather than um, uh, uh, molds will grow is to get them submerged. Uh, uh, and that protects them except at the surface, which is the most vulnerable place where all the problems happen. Um, um, everything's protected from the flow of oxygen, but it's not perfectly anaerobic because water, unless you boil it, has dissolved oxygen in it. So, you know, there's enough oxygen in the brine protecting the vegetables that Clostridium botulism, 
Clostridium botulinum, like growing and developing the toxin is not even a theoretical possibility with, with fermented vegetables. Um, you know, I mean, th there, there certainly are, you know, examples of botulism before canning was invented uh, uh, in 1804, but um, uh, mostly they, they were related to the food that in Latin is botulus, which is sausages, cured sausages. And, you know, this is the reason why people started using, you know, curing salts, sodium nitrate and sodium nitrate, because they prevent the possibility of botulism in tightly packed uh, uh, sausages. Um, uh, so, and, and I mean, there, there are uh, certainly other examples around the world. Mostly they have to do with um, uh, uh, high protein substrates. So like for instance, most of the botulism in North America today is happening in Alaska. And it's basically, you know, native people who are, who are using uh, uh, traditional methods for fermenting uh, marine mammals or fish. But instead of using grasses to line the pits as their ancestors did, they get the idea that maybe they'll improve upon, upon it and, and line it with plastic. And you know, if they manage to completely seal it off, then it could become vulnerable to, to botulism. But botulism is something that only can happen in an extremely contrived environment where you know, all the oxygen is, uh, 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 is blocked off or, or removed. Uh, how much, how do you know how much salt to add to a perpetual brine? Taste. I mean, really, like, I, I just think with salt, it, people have to, you know, rely, rely on their taste. So, okay, let, let's just think. So, I mean, my recipe for this is, is extremely light uh, 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 salt, um, you know, probably, you know, somewhere around like one and a half percent salt in the brine. Um, you know, but, um, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to look in my book to see exactly how much salt is in that recipe. But, you know, with, with salt proportions, in, you know, unless you're dealing with, like, you know, meat or other long-term high-protein substrates, like miso, um, uh, you know, salt to taste, you know, anything with fermenting vegetables, like, just don't take the proportion of salt in my book or in anybody else's book as, um, you know, as, as, as a hard guideline. Um, uh, you know, salt is not absolutely necessary for safety. I mean, <clears throat> there definitely are traditions around the world, uh, a couple of which I write about in this book, um, uh, a couple of which I've written about in my earlier books, where people ferment without any salt at all. The biggest challenge of not using salt is texture of the vegetables, as I discussed with cucumbers. Without any salt, vegetables can get soft and mushy. In fact, there was a <clears throat> there was a business in California that for 20 years was making salt-free krauts um, under the um, you know what I would consider misguided notion that you get better probiotics without salt. Um, um, it was called Rejuvenative Foods. It was out of Santa Cruz, California. I mean, I would say their kraut didn't taste very good because it had a, you know, it had a soft, mushy texture, but they produced it for years without any safety problems. So, you know, you don't absolutely need salt. Now, on the other hand, like if you have grandparents who were making sauerkraut, who learned from their grandparents how to do it, you go back just a few generations and this was an important survival food for people. So, you know, if they were from a region of the world where, they had plentiful access to cheap salt, they probably made it really, really salty because, you know, if these are the last vegetables you're going to see for the next six months, you know, you have a, an incentive to make it really salty because salt is a preservative, is a preservative in its own right, even without fermentation. So, um, you know, a lot of the traditional methods use a lot of salt, but you don't have to use a lot of salt. So, you know, this is the, this is almost the end of, of a, um, a, a 200 liters. So like, you know, 55 gallon vessel that I have um, um, uh, of mostly radishes and a few cabbages and some chili peppers, um, but it's exceedingly low salt, like probably less than 1% salt. You know, so if it's 200 liters, that's 200 kilos of vegetables. That means I use like, you know, less than two kilos of salt for it. Um, 
So, but, but, but because, you know, I've learned through teaching workshops, like how much variability there is to what amount of salt people find pleasant. And this is reflected in cookbooks. I mean, it's the rare cookbook that will tell you in their recipe for like lentil soup or, um, uh, uh, you know, or a chicken dish, exactly how much salt to use, like they'll say salt to taste. And, you know, fermented vegetables don't have to be different from that, like salt them to taste, understand that the longer you want to preserve it for, and or the warmer the environment it'll be in, you might want to use more salt. But, but beyond that, if you're just making short-term batches that you're going to ferment for 10 days on your kitchen counter and then put it in your refrigerator, there's just no reason to use a lot of salt. Um, um, you know, you can, you can make a very low salt fermented vegetables. And, um, you know, I like, I like making them with lower salt because then I can eat more of them and I really like them. And if, if they're very salty, then, you know, I just want to have a, a, a very little bit of it. Okay. Here's a question. What recipe do you like best for Swiss chard? Whenever she makes it, it comes out tasting kind of muddy. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, to me, the part of Swiss chard that I love to ferment is the stalks. And I mean, you know, I mean, I don't mind leaving the leaves on, but, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll really turn to almost nothing. It's this, the, 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 the stalk that, um, um, you know, has this like beautiful firm texture that maintains well under fermentation. Um, but, you know, with Swiss chard, I, I mean, I tend to, I tend to like mix it with other vegetables. Um, uh, uh, so, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that I have a specific recipe, you know, I would just say, you know, um, um, uh, um, you know, Swiss chard stems, um, um, you know, with lots of garlic, and you can either do it as dry salting sauerkraut method or, or, or under a brine. And I think it's really delicious. Um, you know, I, I haven't really experienced um, um, a flavor from it that I would describe as, as muddy. I mean, certainly in Poutsai, Swiss chard is wonderful, especially the stems. Um, you know, any kind of like crispy stem, you know, I love to put celery in it. Um, um, I love to, like, I grow the uh, Chinese style of, of, it's called stem lettuce, or sometimes in English, we call it celtis. And, and, and you take the stem, it, you know, like once it, once it stalks up, you, you cut off that stem and you peel the stem and it's just got such a beautiful uh, uh, texture and, and mild flavor and ferments really beautifully. Do you also have a recipe for a sweet relish, a fermented version of the American condiment? Well, I mean, the thing is, it's hard, like, uh, it's hard to ferment. If you ferment something sweet, it's not going to stay sweet. Like that, that's the limitation. Like, you know, um, um, you know, vinegar pickles, you can make very sweet. A vinegar relish, you can make very sweet. But, you know, where you have an active fermentation, you know, what's fermenting are carbohydrates in the vegetables. And if you add sugar to that, you know, that it'll just make it get more sour quickly. So, you know, what I would recommend if you want to make, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, let's say like, I mean, I've met people whose family tradition is sweet sauerkraut, but they ferment the cabbage just with salt. And then they, they met, might mix sugar in when they serve it. Um, um, so, so it'll be sweet and, you, you know, I mean, I'm not drawn to that at, at all, but, but I mean, I also do some vinegar pickling and if I, you know, I like, I, I sometimes like to have sweet slices of pickles and, you know, that's just something that lends itself much better to like a, a, a vinegar pickling, uh, a, a, a method than, a, than a fermentation method because in fermentation that, that sugar would become food for the microbes. Right. So on the, the subject of sugar, uh, someone who is a diabetic wants to understand, um, wants to ferment a torshi, which Persian fruit chutney, does the sugar disappear in the process? Well, okay. I mean, I, I, I haven't seen this particular recipe. You know, torshi is a is a, like a word that like appears in so many different cultures. I mean, really from like 
you know, Bulgaria to Iran and, uh, and, and beyond. Um, but if it's a, you know, I, I, I mean, sure. I mean, will, whether it will disappear depends on how long you ferment it. Fermentation is always a matter of degree. You know, you, most kombucha that you've been served is sweet, but if you ferment it long enough, all the sugar will be gone and it'll taste like vinegar and it probably won't be that appealing to drink. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, if this style of, 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 of torshi that you want to make, I mean, if you've tried it before and it was sweet, there was still, you know, sugar in it, whether it was sugar that was added or, or sugar from, from the fruits, um, if it was not sweet anymore, then, then it means that, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the sugars all were metabolized in, into acids. Um, you know, in, in, um, in wild fermentation, my first book about fermentation, um, this is the, 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 the 2016 revised edition, but I have a recipe for fruit kimchi, which is something that I, I learned about from a woman I met uh, uh, where I live in Tennessee, uh, uh, who had spent some time living in Korea. But, um, uh, you know, when I make fruit kimchi, I, I, that's a very short term ferment. I like to ferment it for only like four days or something. So I can get like all the contrasting flavors and the, you know, the, the sweet fruit, the spices, the uh, 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 emerging sourness, the saltiness, you know, get all those contrasts. But if I ferment it for like 10 days, all the sweetness is gone. And then it's just like intensely sour. Um, um, and so, you know, with the torshi, you know, if, if there's some added sugar in it, I would imagine it's the same kind of thing where, you know, if you want to enjoy the sweetness, you have to, um, just let the process go for a short time. And if you let it go for a longer time, then all of that sugar will metabolize and it'll get intensely sour. So speaking of sugar still, have you ever fermented sugar cane or a sugar cane drink? Sure. Oh my God. I mean, all the regions where, where sugar cane grows, um, um, you, you know, people press it into juice and either drink the juice fresh or, or, or ferment it. Um, and, uh, sure. I mean, you know, I don't live in a place where sugar cane grows, but, you know, in my youth in New York city, I used to buy it like Dominican markets, uh, um, you know, just like pieces of sugar cane and just like gnaw on them. And then, you know, in my travels in the tropics, I found that in a lot of places where sugar cane grows, you know, there's sort of small, uh, 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 vendors who will just juice it like this. And, um, um, you know, you can buy a glass of sugar cane juice, which is, outrageously delicious but the one thing that makes it better is to ferment it for a couple of days and um um you know like you know lightly fermented sugar cane juice is is incredibly delicious you can ferment it longer and make a make a a, a stronger alcoholic beverage but um but yeah absolutely i mean there's there, there's nothing we could possibly eat that cannot be fermented I mean, I, I haven't, you know, personally fermented everything that there is, but, you know, they're just conceptually like there's nothing we could possibly eat that cannot be fermented. Now, not everything has equally prominent traditions of fermentation. Um, you know, so for instance, there's a lot more fermentation of cabbage than there is of kale or collards. It's not that you can't ferment kale or collards. I mean, anything you could do to a cabbage, you could do to kale or collards. It's just that the dark green vegetables with a, with a much higher chlorophyll content have a stronger flavor when they ferment. And, um, you know, one of the great virtues of cabbage is it has a relatively mild flavor. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I've met people who say, oh, my favorite vegetable to ferment is kale. Uh, I've met people who 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 felt like you know when they tried fermented kale it was a failure that it, that it tasted awful. So you know I I can't tell you what you'll like. I want to I want to encourage everybody to um, you know be bold in your experimentation, but experiment in small batches so you can find out what you like and and what you don't like. For me, I love kale as a small accent. So like you know if something is uh, you know, 80% 
you know, cabbage or radish or something else and 20% kale, it's lovely as a, as a minor accent. But, it, you know, if it's pure kale, it's not that I hate it. It's just got a very strong flavor that I only want to eat a little bit of. Um, and then, you know, some things like, <clears throat> okay, zucchini, everybody with a, with a garden with more zucchini than they want, than they know what to do with wants to know if they can like ferment all their zucchini and eat it all year. And well, yes, you can ferment zucchini, but it has the same problem as cucumbers, which is it tends to get soft and mushy uh, uh, when it gets fermented. So you could ferment it for a very short time <clears throat> and it can be delicious and you could preserve it in the refrigerator if you wanted. Um, but that's just not that practical for, for most people. So, you know, so an example of a food with like very little tradition of fermentation would be avocados. Um, but I've played around. I mean, I've, I've like mushed avocados in with cabbage and sauerkraut. It's incredibly delicious. Like, you know, there's no specific limitation on, you know, that you couldn't incorporate uh, 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 avocados into something like that. We have reached the top of the hour, but I'm willing to keep on if you want to keep on. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's see. What is it? More questions. Okay, sure. Let, 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 let's go 10 more minutes. Okay. The uh, kind of important question probably is how long can I keep an opened jar of kimchi or sauerkraut? I assume that's in the refrigerator. Yeah, I mean, it just depends. So, so here, my biggest advice would be, um, you know, once your jar gets to be halfway full, consolidate, unless you're going to just eat it quickly, put it in a smaller jar. You know, oxygen is the enemy of food preservation. Um, and, um, you know, when you have a little jelly in your fridge that gets a little mold on the surface, the same thing can happen with your sauerkraut if there's a lot of airspace in the jar. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the more you can like protect your food from oxygen, the longer you can, uh, uh eat it. I can tell you that I once, uh, uh had some three-year-old kimchi that had never been in a refrigerator. It had just been in, uh, in a cellar, uh, uh at Flack Family Farms in, in, uh, uh, Northern Vermont. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a mostly full jar, in acidic, salty food at refrigerator temperatures, there's no reason it wouldn't be fine in five years. Um, uh, um, you know, I think, I, I, I don't think there'd be any specific expiration on it. Um, um, you know, any problem would really be sort of indicated by, uh, by a funky surface growth you know, or potentially over enough time, it could start to get a little bit soft, but that's very unlikely in the refrigerator. And what, um, for the dehydrated natto, what proportion natto, ground sesame and salt do you use for your condiment? Oh, you know, I, I, I vary it, um, you know, roughly, you know, Roughly one part natto to two parts sesame. Um, uh, and, you know, probably with the whole thing, like maybe 5% salt, something like that. I do, I do have a, a recipe for it in fermentation journeys. Let's see, let's see what I put in my recipe. I, you know, the thing is I write recipes because people demand them, but, but you know, I don't really follow recipes. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I really, and I would encourage people even following my recipes to take those, take things like the salt proportions with a grain of salt, as it were, and, um, uh, oh, here, here's the recipe, uh, uh, special sauce. Um, and, and, you know, and I mean, if you taste something and, you think it would taste better with more salt, add more salt. But bear in mind, it's always easier to add salt than it is to take salt away. So, um, you know, I always like to start things with, with less salt than I, than I think. So let's see. Yeah, so I have like one tablespoon of salt for about uh, uh, three cups of, of uh, special sauce powder. So relatively small proportion of salt. Okay, and speaking of salt, 
someone says, um, my kimchi turned out too salty. Any tips to correct it without rinsing it off? Well, that's it, rinsing it off. I mean, you know, or, or diluting it, you know, I mean, adding more, adding more vegetables to it. I mean, that would be the best way other, other than, um, uh, 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 than rinsing it. And I mean, I get why they wouldn't want to rinse their, their kimchi because you'll rinse away all the spice paste and all the spices. But, but I mean, I would say that the, 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 the best way to deal with that would just be chop up some more vegetables and, and add more vegetables to it to, to dilute the salt. Um, I am fermenting beets and I can smell a chlorine bleachy smell. Do you know what that's about? And someone else said they, they get that too. Hmm. From beets. Interesting. I've, I've, I've never experienced that. I mean, I mean, maybe it's possible that some places are, are, are scrubbing root vegetables with some sort of a, you know, chlorine mix. Um, I mean, you know, maybe there's some sort of, a, I wouldn't smell like chlorine if it was just a, a, like a, 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 a byproduct of, of the fermentation. No, I'm stumped on that one. Sorry. Okay. Is there a way to increase lactic acid with some kind of substitute? With some kind of substitute for lactic acid? That's what they said. I don't. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't really know what that means. I mean, you know, there's uh Um, I mean, you know, certainly you can buy lactic acid. I'm, you know, there's like, you know, there was a trade dispute where there was like a, a like a Japanese producer of kimchi, but they weren't fermenting it. They were just adding lactic acid. And then, you know, the, the biggest Korean manufacturer was challenging them calling that kimchi. Um, um, so sure, you could add lactic acid, you know, that's, you know, that you could buy to vegetables, but I don't know why you would want to, um, um, you know, the, 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 the process of fermentation will, will produce plenty of, um, a, a lactic acid. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure I understand what they were getting at with that question. Yeah, the person said, I don't, I don't know, but the person with the beets picked the beets and used well water, the one with the chlorine smell. So mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, here, here's one, one perspective on, um, uh, you know, there can be a lot of different metabolic byproducts happening during fermentation. And, you know, some of it is things that come from, you know, within the vegetables. So, you know, when you're, fermenting like vegetables that have a, you know, a sulfur content, you can get various sort of sulfuric uh, 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 byproducts, you know, some of which, you know, some people don't like, like, you know, they, 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 they associate them um, 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 negatively, but you can get a range of metabolic byproducts and, you know, maybe, maybe some of them smell a little bit like chlorine, but, you know, I can just, say from my own experience like I've never for I fermented beets quite a bit and I've never um uh, you know had a, a flavor like that um um linger like sometimes there can be you know sort of metabolic byproducts with volatiles that 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 sort of um uh, are, are released and then pass so you know so, sometimes you can have sort of a fleeting uh um, um, you know, sort of aroma coming out of something that doesn't reflect the final taste. Um, but I, I've just never personally experienced anything chlorine-y uh, uh, in the flavor of, of fermented beets. I wish I, I wish I could put my finger on that. If, um, you know, to that person, so, oh, first of all, let me tell everybody that I have a website, wildfermentation.com. Um, you know, if you, um, email me your question. When I'm stumped on, on questions related to fermenting vegetables, I refer to them to this um, USDA microbiologist who, I, who I've become friendly with, and he's very good about, about answering questions. So um, if you email me through my website, uh, if you hit contact, it comes to me, um, um, you know, I will uh, uh, um, pass the question on to Dr. Fred Bright and see what uh, um, perspectives he might have on it. Well, we've done our 10 more minutes.
Okay. And of course, there are still more questions, but. Um... Well, you know, fermentation is something that everybody has questions about. Fermentation is part of everybody's life. And, um, you know, most people are, you know, just a step removed from, you know, being directly familiar with the processes that produce foods and beverages that, that, that they, uh, that they eat. So, you know, this is one of the reasons why I think people have been so receptive to, uh, uh, to my work because there's, you know, just a lot of interest in fermentation, a lot of curiosity and, and there's been a lot of mystification and, you know, my, my, my mission is demystifying fermentation for people. And, um, I thank you all for taking some time out of your busy days to, um, uh, uh, to share this time with me. And, um, I want to encourage uh, any of you who are interested to check out my new book, Fermentation Journeys. And, you know, any of you who, uh, you know, uh, uh, are interested in spending a weekend fermenting with me at the Row Center, that's, uh, you know, coming up in about six weeks. And um, there's definitely still some spots available. And, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll do some fermenting together. So, um, so thank you so much. Yes, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you, Sandor, for agreeing to present. My pleasure. It's been great. Okay, well, have a great night, everybody.